He's indefatigable. He is just a wonderful young man. Yes. Kindness. All the attributes that many of you have as well. But, you know, serving as a minister here, he is just absolutely wonderful. And he absolutely loves his family. I will tell you that. He speaks of all of you often. And, uh, He's over there playing basketball. And I pull up the van. I said, hey, man, how about a shot? He gives me the ball. Always respectful. Wants to come to church. Very kind. And he got up here to preach in 2017, I think, which is now six years ago. Seems like yesterday. And he's just a wonderful preacher, and we appreciate him. And you're going to be blessed. And Mama's going to be proud. Come on, can we get the hands up to Jesus this morning? Oh, come on, let's go for Jesus this morning. Come on, Jesus is the one that's worthy of all the praise. Come on, let's lift up for Jesus the praise. He is worthy of every hand clap. He is worthy of every shout. He is worthy of every morning this is my favorite place to preach i call it home and i just have some wonderful people here today but if you have your bible you're going to go to the book of galatians chapter 6 and while you're turning your bible to galatians chapter 6 i do want to give honor where honor is due i want to give honor to our great pastor and first lady can we give him a hand clap we love them so much we appreciate all they do they are these wonderful people they have invested a lot of time in me. They invested time, money, and all types of things that snapped on me. And I'm thankful for all they have invested in me. I give honor to Elder Dawn and the Sister Dawn. Can we give them a hand? So good as him in the hands of God. So thankful for them. I give honor to Pastor Cook and Sister Cook. I give honor to Brother Tim and his family and, and Brother Brandon and his family. Can we give all of our ministers a hand clap, Brother Tito? And, and I'm just so thankful for all of our ministers here today. Can we give honor to Sister Reinhardt? It's good to see Sister Reinhardt. Can we give Sister Reinhardt a hand clap? We love her so much. She's an amazing lady. And we always miss Bishop. Bishop was a great man. He left a legacy. And his legacy is still living on at this point right now. And we give honor to all the ministers. And to our ministry leaders, Brother Paul. Can he, Brother Paul just do an amazing job? Can we give him a hand clap? What a word he brought. Give me, give me five for the hallway. And Brother Jerry Lee, he just do an amazing job. Can we give Brother Jerry a hand clap? What a man's award he brought. My goodness, all the friends here, my son, and And it's so good to see my family here today, my mom and my brother and, my, and his family. Can we give him a hand clap? I love them so much. The more you get to know me, the more you get to know how much I love my family. Family means a lot to me, and my youth can tell you that. I just love my family with all my heart. It's so good to see him in the house of God with me this morning. If you have your Bible, we're going to go to the book of Galatians, chapter 6. Galatians, chapter 6. This is the surgery to amazing. Singing today, she's from Germany. She's here with us. We give her honor today. What an amazing song and what an amazing uh, anointing that was in this house. The lesson chapter six, and we're gonna go to verse number five. The lesson six and five. The lesson six and five. The Bible says that for every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit, shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And the Bible goes on to say, And let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season, somebody say in due season. For in due season we shall reap if we friend not. I come here this morning to preach to you from this topic that God honors work. 
God honors work. Would you lift your hands one more time before you sit it? And would you lift your voice with me and pray that God would have his way? Come on, pray with me, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. God, I pray, God, that you would touch us this morning. God, I pray that your word would come alive and challenge our hearts and our spirits, God. God, I pray that we live here not the same way we can, but we live here differently than the way we can. God, we thank you for all that you're about to do and all that you're already doing in this house. And everybody shouting, in Jesus' name. Jesus. You may be sitting in the presence of the Lord this morning. Thank you for standing out in the word of God. God honors work. This word work is, you can find a million types of definition based on everyone's experience on this type of work. Work is one of those words that if we went around this room, everybody would begin to describe their definition of work based on their experience that they have been experienced with, that they will begin to tell you what they work with. And, and their definition of work might be a different definition of somebody else's work because they just don't work in the same place. And every day of their life, they go through different work in their life. And, and all of us in here could begin to describe work in a different type of viewpoint because of what we have experienced. An example, if there's a young lady that works all day on a computer and sits down on, on her desktop and she, all she gotta do is answer some few phone calls and she eat the Doritos and, and I think she eat Doritos, she picked up the phone and answered the whole day. She can go home from her long day at work. She will begin to tell her husband, hey, I had a long day at work. Can you make me some dinner? And her husband will begin to make her some dinner because he had a long day at work. And that's what the type of work she does. And, and whether you dislike the person or or like the person at the end of her, pay, of her week to be getting a paycheck. Now compare that story to a young man or a male that is a construction worker and he's working as a construction worker and he has to be careful because the same my trust that's going around him and he has to be careful and he's working on some of the hardest days that you can imagine and then he goes home and tells his wonderful wife and say I had a long day at work can you please make me some dinner and he will begin to tell you his viewpoint from work and those two you can't trust them but whether you like them or not they'll be getting a paycheck at the end of the week based on the work that they have done so they will begin to tell it from the viewpoint of everybody that works a different job and they will begin to describe you what work really means to them yeah. but I come to tell you not the work that God honors because there's two individuals that are getting paid, but they have a different point of view of view work. But you, you, I come to tell you that there's some work that God honors, but there's also some work that God dishonors and God disapproves. We find here in, in Galatians chapter 5, a, a chapter before where we read in Galatians 5 and 19, the Bible says, Now the work of the flesh are manifested, which are these idolatry, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, last weakness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, and various immolation, wrath, and strife. Seditions and heresies, divine murders and drunkenness, and revealing a church like of which I tell you before I have told you in town past, that they which do, which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul was writing to the book of Galatians. He said that if you practice these sins, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He said this is the work that God dishonors, and this is the work that God disapproves, and this is the type of work that God declines. So Paul began to write that if you practice these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But he also wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and such with some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Is there anybody that's thankful that I'm not where I used to be, but God has picked me up and he took me to a place that I never picked before. I used to practice murder. I used to practice drunkenness, but here I and work that God disapproved and, and declined. So Paul would write to Galatians. He said those that practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But he goes on say, but some of you are washed and sanctified and justified. We got to know that we got to do what pleases to God. We got to start doing things that God honors. Yeah. But it, it, we are introduced into the Bible as a God that works. 
That was the first thing mentioned in your Bible. If you open up your Bible to Genesis 1 and 1, the Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was, was formless and empty and darkness and over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. So we are introduced in Genesis over God that began to create things out of nothing. He began to work with nothing, but yet when he began to speak, things become into a that there was nothing yet to be for. And so we find a God, he introduced it to us as a God that begins to create and he begins to work. But you've got to understand God was working with nothing. But when he got done working with nothing, the nothing became something. Can I tell you that when you become, when you come to God, you might come formless, you might come empty, and you might come with full of darkness. But when God begins to speak and he begins to deal with your heart, you become something. Because yes, God left the way you are, but he don't and bring it to a light. God is able to bring you out of emptiness and bring it to a place that you are filled. God is able to bring you out of sin and bring you into a place where you can honor God. So God begins to create the heaven and the earth. Now God is working with nothing. But yet we have people that come with God and say, I'm broken and that's great. God can work with brokenness. And we come to God and say, well, I'm just full of darkness. That's great. God can work with darkness. So we find that God that begins to work with nothing, but when he gets done, he left something. If you come here today and you are empty in your spirit, you can live here with God. And God can begin to change you for the better. Somebody say amen. amen. Which means you can live, you can live a life without the spirit of God. The earth without formless and empty. But when the spirit of God begins to move on that place, that place became a living place. It has life. Sometimes you need the spirit of God to operate in your life. Yes, you can live a life without God, but it's not going to do you any better. You need a life that is full of God's spirit. You need a life where God is controlled, and you are not in the list. Somebody say amen. amen. So in Genesis 1, we find that God that speaks into existence. And he said, let there be light. And there was light where there was no light before. It was darkness. But when he began to speak, light became in atmosphere. Now we can see light. In Genesis 1, he's a God that speaks. But we go down to Genesis chapter 2. We find a God that does not only speak, but he's a God that can get his hands dirty and begin to work with things. In Genesis 2 and 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. God began to form man out of the dust of the ground. He said in Genesis 1 I'm not just a God that spits but I'm a God that can keep my hands dirty and begin to work with mankind. He said I invite you so much that I'm not going to spit you into existence but I'm willing to get my hands into the dust of the ground and begin to put you together. Can I tell you there is nothing wrong with you. Every single part of you God has ordained the breath of God. You need the breath of God in your lungs. We can sing a song that is his bread. I tell you it's the breath of God that we are here this morning. Don't ever take the little things for granted. I'm thankful this morning that there's breath in my body which means there's more work that I gotta do for God. As long as you got work, as long as you got breath, that is work that God wants you to do. As long as you can speak, that is work that God wants you to do. As long as you can occupy and move, that is work that you to do. Don't ever take your help for granted. Don't ever take what you have for granted. Because God wants the glory out of your life. Is there anybody that's willing to say, God, I'm thankful for the breath that you have given me, but I'm ready to put it to work. I'm ready to put what God has given me to work. God did not call you to be comfortable. Matter of fact, he said, I called you to be a witness. I do the uttermost part of Judea, which means when God calls you, he begins to send you and he begins to work with you. Come on, I'm telling you, it's not enough to just come here and sit down. There's work that God wants us to do, and God will honor your work. When you begin to work for the kingdom of God, God begins to honor your work. When you begin to put your flesh out the way, and begin to honor God with your work, God can begin to use you too, for his glory and for his kingdom. Somebody say amen. amen. And so man becomes a living 
live it so. I forgot breathe the breath of life into his nostrils. You need the breath of God to become a living soul. Yeah. In Genesis 2 and 8, the Bible says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Watch this. He created the garden in Eden. And there, and there he put the man where, whom he had formed. This is a great verse. I want you to understand this. God planted the garden of Eden before he ever created the man Adam. Because when he created man Adam, he had to have a place to put Adam into. So he begins to create a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man Adam right there. Before God created Adam, he had to create a place where he would put Adam at. And can I tell you, I was just a young boy. i just tell you a little bit of my story. I was born in East, in East Africa, a small country called Rwanda. And I never imagined myself in America here at the Pentecostal of Denton. I was just a young boy with all there in Africa, just living life the way I knew. I never knew you guys existed. You guys never knew I existed. So here I am in Africa. I remember in order for us to play soccer, we call it football back home. We had to get some rubber bands and get some cover back and put it back and put it together so we can make the bats hard and we would kick the ball around. And I was just there living in the moment. Never knew I would be here to this day. So we would make soccer balls that way. We would kick around and, and play. And then in that moment, God was creating the Pentecostal day. So when he go put me out. God began to create places before he ever put you out. So here I am in a whole different continent, a whole different country. Never knew we y'all existed. Never knew. But here's God just walking with me back home. And here I am at the Pentecostal day, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't you tell me God don't have a plan for you. Don't you tell me you've been too far. Don't you tell me that God can't use you no matter where you are. God will get you and will put you to a place where God can begin to use you. It don't matter where you've been. It don't matter where you're from. It don't matter what language you speak. When God gets a hold of you, he can begin to use you for his glory and for his kingdom. Somebody say amen. So we're just a young boy playing soccer in the East Africa called Rwanda. And me and my family can tell you, we used to walk somewhere so far trying to catch the bus and go to this church. It took us about hours to get there because we just worked. That's what we did. We would have to walk so far to catch a bus, to drop it off a location. And then we would have to walk from that location for a lot of more miles just to get to church. We had a passion of getting to church. And so I was there. Matter of fact, I tell you a little bit of history about Rwanda. Back in 1994, there was a genocide that happened in that place. It was a civil war where mankind would begin to murder. And it was so bad. It was horrific time that happened in that country. And so most people don't even like to talk about it at this point where they are from. It is something that has forever traumatized the whole life because you have to watch your kid get murdered and you couldn't do nothing when you begin to speak, they will murder you as well. And it was a place of horrific, nobody talks about it. If you find this one, then you begin to talk about it. Matter of fact, they will find a way out of it because they don't want to talk about what happened in that country back in 94. And so fathers will literally watch their kids get slayed and murdered and they couldn't do nothing about it. And one thing about men, we have power. What we want to do, you can't watch somebody get murdered out of your own family and not do anything about it because there's something about a story that man wants to hold. But it was a moment that you can't even use your power and your authority to do anything. So those men will literally murder. And so there was things that happened in that country that forever traumatized the people that was from there. But I'm telling you, God was up to something. I don't know why. But 27 years now, I go on Facebook and find Pastor Cody Mayer preaching the gospel. And I found Pastor Simon King preaching the gospel. And those men are being filled with the Holy Ghost. And that took, my goodness, I'm telling you, there's a revival that's happening in that small country called Rwanda. Because when God gets a hold of the country, there's nothing that you can do about it. So God is sending a revival there. I see that there were 600 people. I gave him a photo. I don't know if you are able to put it up. There's about 600 people there. And there's people outside the church that couldn't even get in because God honors work. There was men in USA that was willing to fly and go to Rwanda and God began to pour out his spirit. Why? Because God would always honor work for him. And so with neighbors putting on neighbors and family and over 800,000 they were still finding dead bodies to this point that you, there were just so many people that were cruel and they were killed in that, in that in the civil war. And this tragedy have left many wondering how people of Guana could ever overcome such hatred and honor. And after it ended in July 1994, Guana was a devastated country. Its basic influence was destroyed. Millions of people were displaced and many surviving have lost their families. So now they 
walk faith forever because that can begin to tell you how can you tell me that God loved me when I walked with my own kid get murdered right in front of me how can you tell me that there's a loving God when our country went through this and then we begin to question God but I'm telling you God was up to something because there's a revival that is happening and I'm just thankful that There are moments that you never thought would occur in your life. But yet you find yourself into a place where you don't know what to do because you thought life was all perfect and good. But I come to tell you, there are moments that happen in that place that forever traumatize families to this day. They will not openly talk about it without tears flowing down their eyes because of the things that they have seen. And we had, my family would tell you, they had to walk from country to country to try to get away from the horrific, the horrific trauma that was happening in that place. And, and they had to get our kids and, and go to a whole different country because if they stay there, they would not make it out. So they would have to walk from a whole country to a whole different country. But God began to honor their work because they were doing it to do a place for our families. I'm telling you, there were things that you might not be able to change, but if you put it in the hands of God, God can begin to change it for better and begin to change it for his glory. Don't ask me how God does it. I'm just a believer that God can take nothing and make it into something. Don't ask me how he does it. I'm just a Christian that can believe that God is able to turn my mess and turn it to a message. I'm just crazy enough to believe that God can take the worst day of your life and make it to the greatest day of your life. He's the character testify when, when she got arrested. He thought he, they probably thought it was the worst day, but look at years now later, women are getting baptized all across the United States of America. They're getting baptized in Jesus' name. The worst day, she thought it was the worst day, became the greatest day of her life. I'm telling you, when you give your worst day to a God that can make it good, God can begin to use it for his glory. Somebody say amen. Your worst day might be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. But we've got some work to do. We have some work to do to reach this world. The whole world needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need hope, they need peace, they need joy. But mostly they need salvation. I'm telling you what we need in this house this morning. We need salvation more than we need anything else. You've got to make sure your heart is right with the king. You've got to make sure that every day of your life that you are honoring God. Because your family needs salvation. But I come to tell you, is your family worth fighting for? Is your children worth fighting for? Is your spouse worth fighting for? I'm telling you, if they are worth fighting for, then we've got some work to do. We've got to reach. We've got some work to do. And when you begin to work, for his glory, God will begin to honor your work, and God will begin to bless your work, and God will begin to do something great in your life. Yeah. I remember this one time I had this whole youth group of about seven kids, and there's, there's no, I'm telling you, we went to Ohio camp, and some of our youth students couldn't make it, and I understood if you know me. I didn't have no other spirit behind that. So I have about seven kids with me, we go to Ohio camp, does we get the Tuesday? Services go to Wednesday night. I have these seven kids around me. I was there. And, and Tuesday night, Tuesday we get that we have fun. And on Wednesday, and, and Wednesday morning, I felt this spirit of heaviness so heavy on me. I never felt it before. And, and now we're like, what is going on? 
I felt the spirit of heaviness and, and I started hearing these voices that, that you're not going to be able to control these kids in one week. You won't be able to handle all these kids out of Ohio camp by yourself in this one week. And Brother Noah gets up and starts preaching. And he's talking about saturated hands, how you're going to clean your hands out. And I felt a spirit of heaviness on me so strongly. I never told this anybody. So I get up at the altar on, on Wednesday morning and I say, God, you've got to clean my hands out. And there's a spirit of heaviness that's on me so strong that I never felt before. I went up to the altar on Wednesday morning. I began to lift my hands. As I began to lift my hands, I felt the spirit of heaviness literally come off of me because I'm telling you, when you begin to give your worries and you begin to give your things to God, God will begin to honor your work. I'm telling you, I felt the spirit of heaviness on me so strongly. But as I lifted my hands on Wednesday morning, God began to tell me, you're going to be all right because you're working for the when they have to lead people. And he begins to talk with me with some of the greatest talk I ever had. And he begins to me, that's why it's so important to pray for your youth leaders and pray for those that are in charge because that spirit of heaven that can get on, on, on them. Yeah. Yes. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10. The Bible says, whatsoever thy find them to do, do with all thy might. Yes. For there is no work, yeah. no device, yeah. no knowledge, yeah. no wisdom, whether thou goest, the Bible was saying that in whatever your hands find us to do, you ought to do with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. Because when you leave this earth, there's no wisdom, there's nothing that you take into the grave. So why not work for God? Why are you still able to work for Him? Why not come to church? Why are you still able to come? Why not give God some glory? Why are you still can? Because when we go, you can't take. Somebody 
of the very thing. That he which have begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, everything that you begin to do for God, God will begin to perform it and until the day he comes back, until he takes us home. He can perform everything that you have started for him. If you have not started getting the boat and begin to work for the kingdom of God, it was Noah. Noah was preaching for several years and telling big people, come and help me build this ark. There's going to be a flood that comes and you've got to make sure you inside the boat. They thought he was crazy because there was no rain that had rained so long. The land was dry. There was nothing flowing. There was no rain coming down. And no one was just crazy enough to believe there's going to be a day when the flood comes. And if you're not inside of the boat, you will be lost. So no one gets to preach for years and years. And nobody really understood what he was preaching about. Here comes the day. No one gets done making the ark. The rain began to do, do down. And when they see the rain come down, the first thing they did, the rent to the ark because they understood the man that preached a message over and over again there's going to be a flood that comes and if you're not inside the ark you're going to be left out so he didn't come knocking on the ark Noah didn't shut the door but the Bible says that God shut the door even though Noah had compassion and he could have maybe opened it a little bit there was no way that he could do anything the ark was shut and no man can open it and they remember the messages and the messages that they heard all and over again, no told us that there's going to be a rain that comes that never understood and that never applied it to their life. So Noah and his family, God honored Noah and he honored his family. They were inside of a covenant where everybody else was screaming and yelling and wondering what is going on. I come to tell you the best place for you to be at is inside the church. It's inside the house of God. Don't you find yourself out there when church Getting ready to close. I don't know how long I went. You just to tell me close. Galatians, we find in chapter 6. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Right. And for whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. Which means whatever that you are sowing, you will find yourself reaping what you are sowing. And the Bible tells us that if you sow with, yeah. with the flesh, your flesh will reap corruption. Which means that when you begin to sow out of your flesh, the result of your sowing is corruption. Which means you don't need to be sowing out of the flesh. You want to tap into the spirit of God. And the Bible tells us that if you sow out of the spirit, you will reap life everlasting. Which means that I got to put my life into the hands of God. I'm going to sow the spirit of God. You cannot show up to the flesh because you will rip corruption. And the Bible says and let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season we shall rip if we faint not. We got Brother Tim. Let's give him a hand. The Bible says, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that Peter stood up with the 12 disciples. And he had the keys to the kingdom. And he said, Unto you, I will build my church. And when Peter stood up with the 12 disciples, they asked Peter, what shall we do? Because we just crucified Jesus. The Bible has said that he pricked them in their heart and they were burdened. And they said, what shall we do for what we just did? And Peter said, what you can do is repent of your sins.
It's a God is a spirit. You can't see God. And the Bible tells us that Jesus was the image of God. And the Bible tells If you haven't been baptized in that name, we baptize in Jesus' name. Which means, in Jesus' name, is the one that can take away all your sins. When Jesus was being crucified, they took all of your sins. And he said, I'm dying for you. Because I loved you so much. Acts 2.38 yeah. What's your name? Rwanda Brother Tito is going to do it in English and Sister Sarah is going to do it in German Listen Every language needs to know how to be saved right. Record If you got your camera Go Facebook Live Fallon We need a few Facebook Lives here This is a new broadcast It's on Currently on the Pentecostal date But uh, I would like this to go to as many people as possible. For all those that speak Kenya Rwanda, of course, English is a very common language in America, as we know. German, a little less common, but there's some German people that can hear this this morning. There's only one way to be saved. There's only one name. There's only one name. Acts 4 and 12. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that was Peter saying, let it be known that this man in Acts chapter 3 and verse 1 was healed by the name of Jesus Christ. Then he said, neither. In other words, referring to that name that healed the lame man. Now you don't think there's power in words. There really is. There's power in our words. But when you speak the name of Jesus, now the lame can walk. The blinded eyes can open. Asthma can be healed. Diabetes can be healed. Cancer can be healed by the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We got a few people on Facebook Live. All right, we got three languages here. We hear Rwanda. 
Bire tu bire mubia kujini mwa itiza chaka bire umrongo umrongo tatu na kari nini? Bire ira tu bire ngo abo wana bumbi se ibyo bwa kumita mumi tima nuko baba ya petro ni zindi dunga bati baka abo me ne da tumge se tujire dute petro ala wosubi za ati gundi mihane umuno wese muri mwe abatizwe mu izina rya Yesu Kristo ngo mubone kuba barizwa ibyaha byanyu kandi namwe muzahabwa iyo mano y'umuka wera the bible says in acts chapter 2 verse 38 then peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the holy ghost In Apostelgeschichte 2,38 steht geschrieben, und Petrus sprach zu ihnen, tut Buße, und jeder von euch lasse sich taufen in den Namen Jesus Christus zur Vergebung eurer Sünden, und ihr sollt die Gabe des Heiligen Geistes empfangen. Yeah.